Let me introduce our speaker. So I'm really thrilled to introduce my very dear friend and wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Stephen Palumbi. Steve and I have a friendship that goes back decades now and um, really, really, when, when I proposed we bring Steve up, I thought we'd be in person by then. So <laughs> kind of frustrated that he and I get to have yet another long distance conversation, but um, it is wonderful to have you here, Steve. So Steve is Jane and Marshall Steele Professor of Marine Sciences and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University in California. He's also a Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation and therefore knows um, a number of us through that uh, connection. And Steve is somebody whom, well, I'm very, very fond of, and I also greatly admire his blend of scholarship and practical conservation. And it was for that that I really wanted you to get the chance to listen to his stories. So Steve has recognized, of course, that research has much more value if it's then transferred into application. And his research group engages in studies of genetics, evolution, and systematics, of marine species that range from corals to sharks to whales and yes to seahorses. Um, a major focus of his research is on conservation and management of marine populations and he's done a lot of work also on identification of seafood products available in commercial markets leading to important testimony that influence for example whale um, consumption in Japan. Um, he is also very involved in strategies for finding and then protecting the world's strongest specific corals, allowing for hopefully improved resilience in a time of climate change. Steve is, of course, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, which is equivalent to our Royal Society, um, and is on the boards of quite a few conservation NGOs. So his work has been used in, in very relevant um, change. Uh, he's been influential in the design of the current network of MPAs in California and the seafood labeling laws in both Japan and the US. He's also a really good communicator, as you'll soon hear, with lots of work on television and film documentaries. In fact, he has his own micro documentary project called Short Attention Span Science Theater, where they do one minute videos, two minute videos. Steve writes a lot, I don't know where he finds the time, but he's written a couple of great books called The Death and Life of Monterey Bay, which is a story of recovery and revival and the evolution explosion. But his most recent book, is extreme life of the sea, about the weirdest, the wildest, the biggest, the shortest species in the ocean, which he wrote with his son and novelist, Anthony Palumbi, Tony Palumbi. And with that, I really invite Steve to give us his seminar. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. It's really great. It's it's really great to be here. I I, I share the like, oh, too bad we couldn't we couldn't do this uh, in in person. Um, but there are these two advantages, right? One is that that I get to talk to you without having to come all the way up to to Vancouver, and then the other is like what Amanda said: your 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 faces have your names on them, and so that's like an incredible advantage. Uh, and over the last year and a half, like many of you, is like we've all suffered the disadvantages of of being separated this way. There are, but every once in a while, these few advantages you have to take, you just have to grab and and take advantage of. So, so thanks for the ability to just sit very comfortably in my office and and still and still reach you this way. There's there are many friends up. Um, at UBC, uh, including at the, the Institute. And it's great to see um, all the all the new faces and all the new the effort that's that's gone in there. Um, talking a little with Catherine before this, um, she sort of encouraged me to uh, to blend a bunch of different themes together. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about our, our approach to uh, to the conservation and climate change with a with a genomics thread that runs through it. Um, Mostly because this is a, a, a relatively new technology that's just ballooned incredibly uh, to the point where the stuff we're doing now in the lab, we simply could not, we simply couldn't have done uh, five years ago or 10 years ago. And that has revealed a whole lot of new aspects to how fish populations evolve and how they relate to their environment. I'm trying to, we're going to try to give you a sense of what's new about what we know about how genetics works um, in, in the face of climate change. But a lot of the work that we do um, is in fact, uh, not, in, not in fisheries per se, but in coral reefs. And so what I'm gonna try to do is to, is to blend those together without making it seem too clunky. Um, talk about our work in coral heat resistance, in particular the resistance to, to, to ocean warming, um, and then what that can do in a in a practical way to 
uh, intervene in coral ecosystems to try to help them make uh, help them be a little bit more uh, resilient. All of that in the next 40 minutes or or so. Um, so by all means, ask questions about any aspect of that. I'm I'm fully available to you guys after this for uh, for more detailed conversations on any any um, any aspect. And this this initial picture. Um, isn't isn't the ocean at all it's a, from australia from last year but now um it can be repeated so many places you all have had wildfires this year california of course is now the the na u.s national home of wildfires um, and it has swept through communities all over the west changing the way those communities uh, function those are not the only things that climate change is doing um, but it, it climate change has brought extreme conditions to, to ecosystems all over the planet um, and one of our jobs i think uh is is to take the knowledge we have and the ability and the verb and the and the creativity to try to help get the whole planet through the next the next century and, and as an evolutionary biologist and a, a genomicist um come down and say can evolutionary biology help what about all the genetic genomic technology out there actually um can help at all um, so uh, we, we know that climate change is, is having a large uh, effect on um, ecosystems. Here's just some um, forestry range predictions under, um, under climate change. Um, and uh, the blue in this case is uh, a particular forest species uh, that's a predicted to expand under cli climate change. Um, it's not just forests that would do that. There's plenty of examples in the, in the ocean as well. Um, here's just one for some fish stocks on the east coast uh, of, the, of North America. Uh, in this case, um, blue is range contraction. And what you can see for Atlantic cod is its current range um, is contracting the modeled future range over 20, 40, or 60 years is hugely contracted, whereas smooth uh, dogfish, um, kind of small shark uh, that is masquerading as fish and chips in a lot of places, um, that range is expanding along the East Coast. Um, that's all due to changing weather patterns and changing ocean temperature patterns. Uh, it not only changes the way um, biological populations function and how ecosystems function, but obviously how human communities use the ocean uh, for um, for food and for and for commerce. So um, we also have seen uh, a number of devastating changes in the ocean over time. This uh, is a is a map of coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is where uh, corals uh, coral environments heat up a little bit. Um, it doesn't take very much. They expel their internal cellular algae, uh, depriving them of a food supply. Most of them die um, as a result. And uh, that coral bleaching has become a global event that is in, that is happening more and more and more often. This is the first doubleheader coral bleaching event in, in the world along the Great Barrier Reef and other spots in the tropics, 2016 and 17. The red dots there just show where the most severe bleaching happened on the Great Barrier Reef in those, in those cases. Um, so thinking across ecosystems about how organisms really react to environmental shifts like climate change, um, so you can boil it down to they can move and they, or they can acclimate, adapt, or die. Um, and if any of you can think of a fifth way, uh, then um, just let's talk about that too. That would be really interesting. And um, for organisms that I, a lot of the organisms I work with like corals, they can't move. I would really rather than not die. And so we're stuck with acclimation and adaptation as the way that um, species can be um, changing. Um, in, in response to climate change. Um, I, I did forget there is this fifth way too that people can uh, react to climate change and that's just to simply ignore it and hope it goes away. And so far that hasn't worked all that well. Um, uh, luckily that's becoming less and less of a popular thing to do even in the United States. Uh, but still we have to keep focusing on the fact that climate change is a fundamental issue in, across the world and that solving that is one of the existential problems that we we all have to face and, and contribute to. Um, for corals, climate change and bleaching does uh, have severe ecosystem effects. This is just a shot of the, the, great, the great Barrier Reef. Uh, one particular 
um, part of it, all those white things are dead and bleached corals. Uh, they are happening over such a large geographic swath right now that you can actually see them from space. So this really represents one of the major ecosystem shifts that we can point to and say this is happening as a consequence of, of climate change. Um, but from the biological point of view, the population biology point of view, um, the interesting thing is that not all corals bleach when bleaching events happen. This is a very typical shot. This is one species of a, a branching uh, reef building coral. And you can see some of them are white and dead and some of them are just fine. And so that variation is an asset and it allows us to think about how to use that in the future, uh, particularly if we can understand the mechanisms by which that happens. So we've been studying that in a long, over the last five to eight years in, a, in two different places. One is in American Samoa, um, which is in the, uh, the Southern Pacific, uh, kind of just south of Hawaii and a little bit west. Um, and here, back reef pools heat up quite a bit and actually hit temperatures that um, really generate coral bleaching in most species, but they don't bleach in these uh, back reef pools. And so we spend quite a bit of time in, the, in this area um, looking at the biology and the physiology of these corals in order to see how it is they manage to survive these conditions that um, other corals couldn't. And um, for example, this is just a trace of the temperature on one back reef area um, in, in, the, in the summer for a tidal series. And what you can see is that low tide in particular, when the water is down to just a couple of meters, a meter or so deep in these back reef pools, they're heating up to 34, 35 degrees. Uh, the nominal bleaching temperature in these areas is about 30 degrees. So how they're surviving in these, these very warm periodically um, overheated environments was, was some of the, the first estimates that we tried to make about mechanisms for, for surviving these. Um, we took advantage of geographic micro variation in temperature um, to look at that. What's shown here are a set of coral heads and back reef pools. There's two clusters here to your lower left and your upper right. The color there represents the, uh, the amount of time in a particular time series uh, that the coral spent above 32 degrees C. And uh, one, of the, one of the great things that has popped out into the, the market in the last five or so years are these small thermal recorders that, that's, that's shown on the right, uh, on the left here. Um, you, we basically tie them down by every coral that we, we look at and essentially get an idea of the temperature that that particular coral is seeing um, over time. So the upper right um, has got uh, largely cooler corals, the lower left has largely um, warmer corals. These are the same species, by the way, and they're only separated by about uh, half a kilometer or so. Um, we then bring these corals back into the lab and test them under, under controlled testing conditions uh, to ask how heat resilient are they. And this is one of the, the setups. This, this setup is actually in Palau, but, but it's the same setup in, in Samoa. Uh, and then what I'm showing in the lower, the lower left here um, are two corals that came out of a heated tank. That the, the tanks are programmed to act like they're in the shallow water during low tide. They heat up for about six hours and then they cool down um, and the coral on the on the far left uh, came out of that heating system uh, completely unbleached the coral that I'm holding uh, next to it is white and is bleached the only difference there is not the temperature they experienced but where they came from and the one that didn't bleach came from the warmer pool and the one that did came from the, the cooler pool so if you do that um, scientifically and do it, do it in lots of replicates, et cetera, et cetera, and you measure the amount of the symbionts that were in the coral to begin with, uh, and then compare that to how many, what the symbiont load was in those same corals after heating, um, the corals from the warmer pool lose about 20% of their symbionts during our heating trials, whereas the corals from the, the cooler pool, same species, different colonies, um, lose over 50% of their symbionts in the same condition. So it, it gives us like, like uh, almost like a, a, a tread mill stress test to be able to, in a standardized way, ask what the heat resistance is of an individual coral given, given, where, it, given where it lives. And so that um, has allowed us to begin to map coral heat resistance around uh, different reef settings um, and then try to understand the mechanisms whereby 
that that happens. Well, one of the things we know about most uh, most sort of physiological systems, and and Trish knows this, Trish Schulte, because um, she works on it so well, um, is that acclimation happens. You put something in a warm environment, it acclimates to that warm environment. And, and if you remember that slide I showed at the beginning, adapting to climate change and acclimating to climate change are two two different mechanisms by which species respond. How do you tell what fraction of a response is acclimation versus adaptation? And, and one of the ways you do that is by swapping individuals, moving them uh, from one place to another. So we did a reciprocal transplant experiment. We moved the cool corals from the cool environment to the warm ones. We moved the warm ones to the cool environment and then asked after a year or so, um, how heat resistant were they after living in the reciprocal environment. Um, and then uh, what we were able to show is that about half of the difference between the two pools in their heat resistance is acclimation. And the way we know that is because if we take corals from uh, the, the cooler pool and move them to the warmer pool, if you can see my cursor, then that's this, um, this red bar on the left side of this figure. Um, well, they increase their heat resistance, and that's a signature of acclimation, but they don't get as heat resistant as the native corals, and that's a signature of, of adaptation. That is, the native corals have sets of heat resistant tools, whatever they are, uh, that are better than acclimation gives you. Now, uh, we have delved into that more deeply to try to ask what are the what are the underlying genetic and symbiont mechanisms that control that and and two things pop out one is that the symbiont type met, makes a difference once we control for that then we can also tell that there are probably hundreds of genes in these corals that make a difference in their heat tolerance uh, there isn't a, a magic switch that turns on heat tolerance if you just happen to have that gene it's in fact um, controlled by by a large number of genes that incrementally give each coral a little bit of a boost up. At least that's that's what we think um, at this point. And, and that gives us a handle on using this tool um, in, in future restoration efforts and protection efforts um, that's a little bit different than if there were just a single gene that, that turned on heat resistance. Um, consequences, here's our, here's our conceptual model of acclimation and adaptation in the face of climate change. And it's for corals right now, but I have a feeling it probably fits for a lot of different species, plants and animals across the world, where um, adaptation and acclimation both are playing a role. So some corals have many heat tolerant alleles, those are the ones on the top, sort of with that red, um, red figure. Um, some corals have few heat tolerant alleles, and they're fundamentally different in their, their, their underlying heat tolerance. But both of them can acclimate and, and become more heat tolerant in warmer waters, or they deacclimate and become less heat tolerant in cooler waters. So there's a variation then in the, there's a wide range of heat tolerant phenotypes, which is made up of the acclimation response and the genes that the individual organism has. So that's our sort of conceptual model of why there's so much variation in, in this response out in the environment. Some of it due to genes, some of it due to acclimation. The key thing about it is that acclimation isn't permanent, that if you move a coral into warm water and it's heat resistant and then you try to use it, say, in a restoration project someplace else, it might lose that heat resistance, whereas the adaptation, the heat tolerant genes are permanent, and that makes a difference to how you might use these um, in the future. So I want to sort of segue a little bit into um, a bit more about the sort of genomic architecture of adaptation. And that, the reason for that is because as we've learned more and more about, about the genomes of marine species, um, we have become realizing that there's a wide variety of different kinds of genomic architectures for adaptation that plays a role in, um, in populations. In particular, uh, fish genomic studies have turned out a number of really strong surprises about how organisms adapt to changing environments. And, uh, and so I want to sort of go through that a little bit, um, show you what some of the, the, those discoveries are, and then come back to corals and then try to see how we can use those um, in, the, in the future. Um, the, the, the main thing here in this slide is that uh, previous studies of the genetics of marine populations 
uh, might use a very you know few number of loci for microsatellites. Um, and, but as the genetic technology has advanced, we've gone from looking at tens or dozens or scores of loci in the genome of a of an individual um, to thousands or tens of thousands. And now full genome sequencing gives us millions of variants across the whole genome um, uh, to look at. And the, the, the consequence of that is that if, if natural selection is only working on a few genes, if it's only working on a few traits, we're, we're probably, we probably missed it when we were just looking at tens or hundreds of loci. But once we have millions of loci, then we have a much better chance of finding those. And finding those is really cool, but then it also kind of messes up our normal way of using genetics and fisheries management, for example. So it becomes a little bit more nuanced and, and um, I would say complicated, but actually it's really vastly more interesting. Um, and that's because selection acts very different from locus to locus. Whereas the things that we had been using before in fisheries management, uh, for example, looking at genetic differences between stocks, that's driven by genetic drift and dispersal, which affects all loci equivalently. So um, that we'll see makes a difference to how we interpret the data that we've got for, for different, different species. Here's some, some examples. Um, uh, from, uh, this is from the work of, of Carolyn Teppel, a former student in my lab is now at Woods Hole Oceanographic. She looked at green crab uh, genetics in North America. Uh, green crabs came from Europe. They're distributed across a great environmental gradient across which they have adapted to different thermal environments from Morocco all the way up uh, to Norway. They were introduced to the East Coast in 1817 or so, again in the, in the late 1900s, um, and populate the East Coast from uh, about North Carolina up into, um, up into Nova Scotia um, and, uh, and Newfoundland. Uh, and then there was a there was another introduction in the late uh, 80s um, into the west coast of North America, and green crabs have gotten all the way up to you guys in in British Columbia. So the original population had a great environmental gradient where it was adapted to different environments and different temperatures. The introduced population uh, really just came from a few subsets um, of that. Yet that introduced population is nicely adapted to, excuse me, let's back up, nicely adapted to the temperature variation on the, on the East Coast of North America. It has reestablished the genetic climb that it had in Europe, even though it's only been in North America um, for uh, about 200 years and it only um, came from a relatively small um, propagule size. As an invasive species, we'd expect it to be more or less genetically homogeneous and not that well adapted across, across the, the gradients. But this, these data from Carol and Teppold show the cold tolerance of the, the populations that she measured, and she measured cold tolerance, kind of like we measured heat tolerance in, in corals. Um, and then a whole, she did a whole set of genomics on these populations. And what's shown here in, in uh, B and C are the genetics of individual loci as a function of the cold tolerance of those populations. And you can see they're highly correlated. Um, and then A is a com combination of about 50 different genes that all show the same correlation between cold tolerance and allele frequency in the introduced populations along um, the the north coast, uh, the west, east coast of the United States. Um, but in addition, it also shows on the same graph the populations in Europe and the populations on the west coast. So very quickly after introduction, these populations have reestablished their almost, their, their native genetic relationship between tolerance and uh, genetic structure. So it's sort of a surprise how they can do that um, across um, so many genes all at the same time. And uh, the answer is that these genes are different genes and they, they code for different traits, but they're not acting independently. But those, these genes are linked, linked together. Um, so uh, that's, as I just gave away the answer, that's, their, that's sort of um, the question asked here. Um, and this is some sort of the evidence. And I want to walk you through this because it's, we'll see a bunch of these 
Um, what's shown here um, on the on the left are a whole series of um, genotypes of different individuals and different individuals are in different columns and then the genotypes are different colors and the genes are in different rows. Uh, so we have these data from the transcriptomes, we compile them across the genome and then we simply ask how correlated is the genotype uh, of one gene with the genotype of that same gene in another individual. And what we expect from a normal population of interbreeding individuals that are all new, neutral um, is that uh, those genes are sort of mixed up down the generations and there isn't very much relationship um, between one. That is, knowing the, your genotype at one locus doesn't tell you very much about your genotype at another locus. Uh, the figure on the right is a, is a byplot of the genetic correlation of different loci with one another. These are different loci in different genes. And the redder the box, the more highly correlated they are. And so that red box that you see there on the right is a set of genes that is so highly correlated that if I know the genotype of one gene, I can tell you the genotype that that individual will have at another gene. That's really weird. And it's not something we usually see in, in the kind of genetics that you, uh, you would do in, say, you know, your, your introductory biology class. It's called genetic linkage and it, it, it can come from a couple of different, um, a couple of different sources. Um, the easiest source is that these genes are, are linked because they're really close together. And as they're really close together, if you inherit one allele um, from your parents at one gene, and you're going to inherit the allele that's right next to it on that same chromosome too. And so that kind of proximity gives you linkage. Now, usually that linkage is broken up by something called recombination down the generations, and so it kind of disappears over time. But these correlations um, are really strong in green crabs, and they seem to be the reason why that the population was able to adapt so quickly to uh, new uh, across across the East Coast. Um, well. Green crabs are fine, but what about a real fishery species like cod, for example? Um, and it turns out that cods, uh, cod populations also have the same sort of structures. And these have been discovered um, by largely a whole set of great Canadian genetic scientists um, in, in uh, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, uh, but also um, picked up by a former student of mine, um, Brian Barney. Um, and this has shown that cod have strong genetic structure, even with the Gulf, this is in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and that genetic structure uh, was actually misinterpreted for a while. And I want to show you how. So what's shown here in this is um, figure above the codfish are groups of populations that are genetically distinct from one another. Uh, and the, the map there on the lower right shows some of the area in which those genetic distinctions occur. And that, that scale of that, that genetic distinction is pretty small. And so it sort of was a surprise at the time that, gene that cod populations were that genetically different from one another. And it was interpreted as different stocks that didn't interact with one another at all. And so they should be managed differently as different fisheries because the genetics are different. They're different stocks. They should be managed differently because their population trajectories um, are different. Um, but it turns out that some of those data that went into this plot were actually genes that were in areas of chromosomes that were highly linked to one another and under selection. And so these two, these two dots here that are called PAN1 and GMO132 are, are parts of the data set that went into this original COD study uh, where these genes were enormously different uh, than, they were, than, than, they were, than they should be um, comparing those two populations, kind of suggesting they were under strong environmental, um, strong environmental selection. But these are microsatellites, they have no function that we know of, and so that's why people thought they probably couldn't be under, under selection. But then it turns out that the genetic structure of cod chromosomes has these areas in them that are highly linked to one another. And what this shows here is cod chromosome 2 and 7 and 12. And uh, the, the 
red dots are the differentiation that you see um, of particular genes along those chromosomes from population to population. And then the, the orange dots are the essentially um, it's called the linkage disequilibrium. Uh, genes that are recombining normally um, have really low linkage disequilibrium, so the orange dots are really uh, near zero. And when genes are actually prevented from recombining, they pop up and they have a higher level of linkage disequilibrium. Well, what this shows basically is that on, on chromosomes 2 and 7 and 12, there are clusters of genes that are not recombining, and they have high differentiation from one population to the next. So this combination of differentiation and protection from recombination means that these blocks of genes are essentially inherited as a unit from generation to generation. And in those blocks of genes are a large number that could be playing a role in adaptation to different temperatures. And that's what's in fact um, pretty well known for COD, that these blocks of genes adapt populations differently to different temperatures. Uh, they're a cluster, a cassette, essentially a whole toolbox of genes that are passed down from one generation to the next. And like the, like the green crab example, it means that the populations can adapt to different environments very quickly, uh, much more quickly than they could if all those genes were, were separated. So it's the linked genes and their role in heat resistance. That, that's um, the story here. And these are called super genes. Uh, they're known from other kinds of systems. They're known from butterflies. They're known from plants. Um, and that uh, by having these clusters of adaptive genes that per, per allow adaptation to particular environments, um, then those populations can adapt to environments more quickly um, than otherwise and more, and more completely. Um, I showed you examples from green crabs and cod. Um, we can also see them in other cases. Um, queen conch from the Caribbean have them. That the figure on the right there showing those uh, those red boxes. That's just examples of clusters of linked genes um, that play a strong role in differentiation um, queen conch around around the Caribbean. Um, we have data like this from barnacles, from abalone, from fish populations. Um, I won't go through all of them. Uh, I did want to mention one, um, which is a, a beautiful set of studies by Nina Thurkelson uh, when she was here in the lab as a, as a postdoc on, on this fish, uh, the Atlantic silver side of minnow up and down the East Coast. Um, and it became famous in fisheries um, because of a set of experiments that Steve Munch and David Conover did. Uh, essentially, they took these minnows um, from their native populations, they subjected them to experimental fishing pressure. They, they basically fished out all of the small ones uh, for five generations and got bigger ones as a consequence. And those are the ones on the top of this figure. And then they fished all the big ones out like a normal fishery. And then they caused the, the, the populations to, um, to shrink down to the ones there on the bottom. Well, uh, Nina's brilliance in this was not only being able to do the genomics, but being able to go to Steve and David and say, didn't you, did you save those fish by any chance? And they did. They had saved all these fish from a 1990s study. They were in a freezer in, in New York the whole time. And so Nina was able to get 700 of them, get DNA out of them, and do full genome sequencing of them to ask what were the what were the genetic changes that happened so quickly to make these populations change morphologically so strongly. Um, the bottom line is that a whole series of very linked genes are what's driving a lot of these changes. Um, because we know a lot about the genomics of some fish now, we know there's 24 chromosomes, and then just just Looking at them over over time, we know that there are thousands of genes involved. Um, oops, but a lot of them are on um, chromosome 24. So um, that is the the huge the huge difference here uh, on chromosome 24. At the the right of your screen, what you're seeing is the differentiation between selected populations. The higher the dot, the higher the differentiation. There are some genes. That differentiate across the whole genome. But in, if you're on chromosome 24, you have a much better chance of differentiating enormously in this five generation experiment um, showing fisheries effects on, on growth, 
uh, growth speed and um, and and final final size. Um, so that would make sort of everything on chromosome 24 a super gene, uh, and digging into exactly what it was along those genetic. Uh, in chromosome 24 that did that is some of the things that Nina is doing now. She's a professor at, at Cornell and pursuing these, these kinds of things. Um, so uh, in terms of the sort of fisheries, then um, we can kind of go back to a, a pretty famous paper by Robin Waples, late 90s, about how genomics affects the, the fisheries management. Um, you ask, are there two stocks? You, you get that um, by looking at the genetics of two populations. If they're different, you perform a statistical test. If there's significance, then they're separate stocks and you manage them separately because the idea is they're not exchanging members at all. They're, they're not, they're, they're basically different populations demographically. Um, and if they're, if they're not significant, then you manage them jointly because they're all the same population. But if you have a situation where the genetic um, architecture is such that rapid environmental adaptation can happen, then what can happen is you might get separate genetic stocks, even though they're exchanging individuals at a pretty high rate, because selection has the ability to create genetic adaptation pretty quickly, even on a within generation basis. And so um, you might have two genetic stocks, but if selection is generating those two stocks every year, then they might not actually be separate demographic units. And so you have to take the next step and understand the fundamentals of how genomics works to, to actually create those genetic stocks. In order to answer your question, should you manage them as different stocks? So that's how this genetic architecture business turns into more, uh, a, a more practical kind of um, level of, of information. I wanted to come back to corals and, and talk a little bit about uh, that same kind of thing, practical levels of, of information, um, by, by taking a, a look at a study done by a former student of mine, Rachel Bay, who's now at, at um, UC Davis. And in this case, what Rachel did was to take the data we had from Samoa. Yep, got it, Catherine. And, uh, and um, ask, could the populations of these corals in a cool spot in the Pacific, which is Rarotonga and the Cook Islands, could they actually evolve, given what we knew about the genetic structure of adaptation in these corals, could they evolve to be more adapted in the future under climate change? Uh, Rachel created a model of multi-locus genetics, so a couple hundred loci at the same time, and ran it um, in uh, future scenarios under three or four different um, climate projections given different levels of CO2, uh, RCP, um, you know, two, six, four, five, um, oops, six, um, and, and eight. And basically what she found here is that if climate change happens really fast, that's the red line, the coral populations cannot keep up with rapid change and they, they, they die out. Um, but if climate change is relatively mild, that is uh, the smaller rate, 2.6 or 4.5, then those populations can keep adapting to the increases in temperatures such that they can maintain populations over the, la over the next 100 years. Uh, RCP 6.0, in this particular case, they adapt for quite a long time, up to about 2080, and then they can't keep up. Um, and and they, they collapse. Now these these are just based on a particular model or based upon particular assumptions. Um, but we've seen that in a number of other cases over the last couple of years. This is a paper by, uh, by Tim Walsworth that just shows genetic variation allows populations to adapt to climate change under certain scenarios, whereas low genetic vari no genetic variation um, has them collapse. So this just po points to the importance of genetic variation in populations for their ability to adapt to climate change. Um, it's also um, seen in um, recent papers. Uh, this is one by um, <clears throat> Lisa Walcott, uh, oops, um, showing similar kinds of adaptation of corals to climate change 
um, over time. The purple there is when there's no genetic variation and they essentially crap out. Um, whereas higher genetic variation and low climate change means that they have been able to keep up um, with uh, adaptation has allowed them to keep up. Um, just recently, Cheryl Logan and her colleagues published a very similar kind of study in um, the symbionts of corals, again, um, looking at the population size under different climate change scenarios, showing that symbiont evolution can play a strong role if uh, A, there's enough genetic variation, and B, climate change scenarios are not too, too extreme. So in the one, one way, this means that um, understanding the structure and the variation in a population with response to climate variables allows us to begin to predict which ones are likely to have some adaptive potential in the face of, of climate change. Um, last, I want to sort of talk just briefly about um, sort of some of the other uses of this information, uh, they don't depend a lot on the genetics involved, but they do depend upon being able to identify resilient parts of populations. And this is work that we're doing in Palau. We're on a boat here coming through the Rock Islands towards the uh, Palau International Coral Reef Center. Lots of um, postdocs and students and Palauans have been involved in this, in this work. Um, Essentially, we've mapped coral heat resistance around the islands, the, the archipelago of Palau. And in this video, those red dots are, are heat resistant corals. We've, we've mapped and tested um, almost 400 corals of, of 39 reefs. And two things pop out. One is that heat resistant corals are pretty common. Uh, we find them in virtually all the reefs, but they are also a little bit um, concentrated on the warmest reefs. And so if we kind of just look at that um, set of data, uh, the red reefs there in, on, the, on the left side, that red box shows uh, a set of reefs that are relatively warm. Uh, and then the, the bars on the right there show the fraction of colonies in those areas that are heat resistant. And, and the warmest reefs, sub-reefs, patch reefs, have the highest level of um, heat resistance that are there. What we're trying to do with those are two things. One is with, one of which is to set us uh, set up the um, possibility of creating marine protected areas based on climate resilience as a different sort of category that's been used before. And then um, second, uh, to help local communities restore reefs by replanting them, but re not restoring them, but renewing them. Um, this has been a great word that the forestry community has promoted. Um, instead of replanting things that were there before, um, planting things that were more likely to thrive in current, I mean, current and future conditions. Uh, in this case, it's not just the species that are more heat tolerant, but also the genotypes that are the more heat tolerant um, in these particular communities. That's, that's the focus of it. And that's something we call the Strong Corals Initiative, and it's our are in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy and Woods Hole um, and uh, a program we're calling Super Reefs um, to try to, to find where these areas are, protect them, and then use them um, in, in, the, in the future. So um, this is another picture from Australia from um, just a, a few years ago. Um, because this is a global issue at this point, that organisms are seeing massive changes in their environment and uh, massive changes from climate change um, and they're causing massive ecosystem shifts and the ability to understand how populations react to these environmental changes is sort of fundamental to trying to be able to to do um, interventions in them uh, it could be that for some populations the possibility of adaptive change is there already. It could be that it might be necessary in some populations to add adaptive, uh, adaptive variants to them so that they can adapt. It might be necessary in some cases to actually shift populations to different areas so that they can thrive there. This sort of climate resilience engineering is something that um, is a little bit foreign to many of us who have grown up with the idea of just protecting ecosystems in in now and in the future. But the cost of doing nothing right now 
and just protecting the things that are there is just way too high. And so more and more effort is being gone into understanding the conditions under which it might be beneficial and necessary to, to actually um, intervene in, in populations. So as a coral biologist, this is what I sort of think. I, I, I try to find, find as many adapted populations as I possibly can, adapted to future conditions and protect them, use them to regrow um, areas around there and then learn from them what the basic biology is. It's a little bit complicated, right? When you get into the biology of any complicated trait like environmental resistance. Um, and uh, by studying and, and knowing how they're resistant, but by also focusing on how that information can be used at the practical level, um, then we can help move things forward um, in the future. Uh, climate change is this huge problem. I personally can't do very much about stopping the world using CO2, but I'm all for that and will do everything I can to help the people who can actually do that. But it doesn't mean I don't have a job. My job actually is to preserve as much as possible for the next century so that when when climate change actually starts going away, and it, it will eventually start going away, there's enough to grow back from. And, and that's what I kind of want to leave you with, that, that mission. Um, let's protect as much as we possibly can, whether it's corals or fish or, or, or forests or whatever, um, so that when we finally get off of our CO2 addiction, um, the rest of the world can come back. So thanks very much, and I'd be thrilled to have questions. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was... Um a really great um, and thought provoking talk um, with which leaves us with lots to uh, reflect on. And I know for sure that I have lots of questions and I'm sure the audience as well. Um, and here we go. I see several raised hands. Um, so I will start with how about uh, William? Go for it. Thank you, Colette, and, and thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, um, I'm William Cheung, uh, director of the Institute, and thanks for giving this uh, fascinating and inspiring talk. Uh, and um, I think one of uh, the questions relate to your last point. Uh, uh, it seems like I think uh, many think that we are the, the door for uh, directly going into uh, limiting, uh, achieving the Paris Agreement is, 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 is actually closing very fast and that we are looking into an overshoot uh, scenario where temperature will go beyond uh, 1.5 degree or 2 degrees Celsius and then go down. Uh, so based on your, your work on particularly, for example, on, on the ad, increasing the adaptive capacity of corals, uh, how much of that overshoot do you think the world can tolerate uh, before we see that um, uh, we can actually start to drive down global temperature again? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. That's the hardest question of all. So, I mean, <laughs> um, because I don't think there's an answer for, um, for everything. I think everything is going to have its own answer and it will depend on um, things like uh, what's what's the population size that makes it through that that overshoot? Uh, how much genetic diversity is there really? And uh, for 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 marine populations, we're in a pretty good position generally because they tend to be big. Those populations tend to be huge, and they tend to be highly genetically variable. And so um, it's not like we've got the po the situation for white rhino or um, for for populations of plants that are so small. Um, so that the the good news is that there's genetic variation there. The the bad news is that all the models that I have looked at lately show really really strong shifts up in heat, uh, really dramatic ones. Um, often will outstrip the the ability of these populations to adapt. So uh, with with unrelenting CO2 in increases um, for the next 20 or 30 or 50 years, most of the models are pretty dire. Um, with more moderate CO2, maybe not, not I mean, maybe even a little bit stronger CO2 emissions than say the Paris Agreement would allow, um, then for populations that have been modeled, there's, there's a decent chance of of adaptation that's there. Um, I would just kind of come back to the something that that, sh that might just be a simple kind of result that protecting as much as possible with as high as population levels as possible with as much genetic diversity as possible helps that whole adaptive process go. 
and doing that in as many places as we can um, is the goal. Ramping that up, not just, you know, do we want one coral arc, one place in the world where corals live and the rest of the world will be populated from that? Oh no, that is not a good idea. Um, and so expanding it to local communities all over the world is, is the goal. Thank you, uh, Stephen, for that answer. Um, and just to note that because we're quite short on time, if you have a question and we happen to not be able to get around to it, we will follow up with you, Stephen, by email, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Sarah Cannon has a couple of questions for you. Just in the interest of time, um, I'm going to take the liberty of just asking one dimension of it, and it is as follows. Um, she apologizes. She can't ask her the question herself. She's in a bit of a noisy place. Um, so it is... Acclimation to stress is not permanent. Do you have any idea how long acclimation may last and what this could mean for the long-term trajectory of coral reefs in the Pacific specifically? Yeah, that acclimation does not last very long. So it begins to, to fall back after about two weeks, but it also happens in about two weeks. And so this weird paradox is that if you could go to a reef and heat it up a little bit, before the, the heat wave comes and the bleaching event comes, the reef would do better. And so heating the reef could protect it from heat. That's sort of paradoxical. Of course, we can not heat the reef because the ocean is really big and it takes a lot of energy to do that. But I'll just leave that as a sort of funny paradox. Thanks, go ahead, Trish. So Steve, thanks for a wonderful talk as always. Um, I've kind of got two related questions. One relates back to what we, you were just talking about, and that's um, to maybe um, add epigenetic effects into the, the you know, so that, you know, there's that, that, there's that place between rapid and very reversible acclimation and adaptation. And so, right. so that might buy a little more time. And then the second question is, do you actually need, to, and this is a weird question coming from me, but do you actually need to know the underlying genetic or, all do you, all do you, or, or is all you need to, to go to a spot on the reef that's already hot and say anything that lives there must a priori be good at living where it's hot. Let's protect that one. Yeah, you know, I've been I've been there, too. It's like it's all this stuff I've been doing completely useless. And all I really have to do is go find the hot corals and protect them. Um, and so my 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 reason for justifying my own existence is that. Um, some of the mechanisms by which those corals live there are, again, temporary. And they may last for a, two weeks. They might last for a year or two if it's the symbionts that they have. But they might, they're not going to necessarily last for generations. And so I'm interested in really generational persistent change. And there I need to know the mechanisms. So I'm, I've just justified myself. Thank you very much. That helped me justify myself as well. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. That was really fascinating. And I just want to pick up a bit on what you said about the end about how we don't only want to protect, but maybe also get a bit more um, um, proactive about moving the corals and, and re regrowing areas with more heat resistant corals. And of course, I immediately picture corals as part of an ecosystem. So there are things that rely on those corals and interact with those corals. And so, I mean, it's one thing if you're moving like to like, um, but in some cases you'll be moving different types of coral into an area. And I'm wondering what research is underway to understand how that might, for example, affect invertebrate or fish populations that communities depend on or, and then have other effects. And I think this is why people are worried about tinkering, right? Because we don't right. know if we change one thing, what the butterfly effect might be. So I'm just, it's kind of a big question, I suppose, for the time we have left, but I'm just curious no, it's a your great thoughts question. on this. It's a great question. And I, I totally agree with you. And most coral biologists I know are there as well. Kind of, I've, we've done this set of saying, would you be okay with moving corals a kilometer? Um, from one place to another. Everybody says yes. Would you, would you be okay with moving a thousand kilometers? And everybody says no. So somewhere in there <laughs> is, is, the, is the com where the comfort level drops. And you're totally, absolutely right. Moving a coral is not moving a coral. It's moving a whole ecosystem with it because there's the microbes, there's the viruses, there's the invertebrates, there's the algae. A coral might have 
a thousand different microbes. It might have dozens of different um, parasitic worms burrowed into it. And so you have to be really careful about, about that. Exactly, exactly. Do no harm is a really, really, really important thing still. Um, one of the ways people have been thinking about doing that in a clever way is like not moving the corals, but moving their genes, collecting sperm from corals in one place, using them to fertilize uh, eggs from another place, and then having those hybrid populations then, then be your movement. And that has a lot less risks Technologically, it's a lot harder to do. It's um, uh, ongoing research right now. Okay, well, you know, Steve, thank you. As you've heard, you had a you had a bumper turnout of people who stuck with you right to the end. The numbers were stable, so people were finding it gripping, and you had people still joining in all the way through. And um, a huge array of questions in the chat as well that we'll share with you. And all of this speaks to the the passion, commitment, and excellence with which you gave the talk and the, the real fascination that we all have with the sort of work that you're doing. And I think you can take that as one more validation of your existence and justification for carrying on. So I really want to thank you enormously um, on behalf of, of the Institute, UBC's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and um, encourage anybody who's interested to stay in touch with Steve. 